The Port William membership experiences for itself the damage that schools, when run according to the logic of business efficiency and to the dictates of an alien agenda, inflict on their Kentucky neighbors, on their own families, and on their way of life. Jaber Crow, recalling the days before con school consolidation in his town, said he liked best the school as it was when I first knew it, when it served only the town and immediate neighborhood, when the students got there on foot. The school had belonged to the town. Experts shut down the town, sh shut down the school in 1964 and began busing the children to Hargrave. The school board had adopted the language and logic of business and now talked of efficiency, economy of scale, and volume. Closing the school just knocked the breath out of the community, Jaber recalls. It did worse than that. It gave the community a never healing wound. Jaber admits the old school's shortcomings, but something more fundamental than success had been at stake the bond between the school and the community. Some of the teachers, of course, had been bad and some good, he acknowledges. But how good or bad they were, Port William knew, and knew without delay. Whether the parents interfered for good or ill, the school was right there in sight, and they at least could interfere. The school was in the town, and it was the town's talk. Busing and school consolidation, Barry writes, in an autobiographical section of The Hidden Wound, had done these very things to his own children, taking them, quote, well beyond the range of close or easy parental involvement, end quote. And this experience leads him to reflect on the costs of these policies for any community. He writes, there can be no greater blow to the integrity of a community than the loss of its school or loss of control of its school, which always means loss of control of its children. The breakdown of discipline and academic standards in the schools can only originate in and can only cause the breakdown of community life. The public school separated from the community by busing, for whatever reason, government control, consolidation, and other advances, has become a no man's land, a place existing in reference only to itself and to a theoretical tomorrow's world. Likewise, Jaber, his character, understands that his own college and university had attempted to function precisely as this sort of no man's land. The University of Kentucky had become a floating or flying island, possibly a reference to Jonathan Swift, not belonging to anybody or to any place, and serenely disconnected from the consequences of anything it taught. Every one of the educational institutions I had been in, he complains, had been hard at work trying to be a world unto itself. Some tried to be the world of the past. Some tried to be the world of the future. But what was missing was the world of the present, where everybody was living. It's small, short, surprising, miserable, wonderful, blessed, damaged, only life. Inevitably, these institutions turned out graduates who know any number of things about the world except where they are. An example of this ignorance presents itself to Jaber in the form of the young preachers who fill the pulpit week by week in Port William. Even those who might move to Port William never, quote, stayed long enough to know where they were. But knowledge of a place and of a people and of a way of life had never been the point of their education. They were not going to school to learn where they were, let alone the pleasures and the pains of being there. Or what, they ought to, or what ought to be said there, you couldn't learn those things in a school. They went to school, apparently, to learn to say over and over again, regardless of where they were, what had already been said too often. Jaber, who had once felt called to the ministry, spent all his adult life becoming part of the Port William membership. But these preachers had no such intention and made no such effort. Education for membership, or the loss of that purpose for education, pulses through Barry's essays and through his own memory. 
In Life is a Miracle, in which Barry unmasks the pretensions of scientific materialism and its agenda for remaking man and his world, he ponders the sad paradox between the technical expert's precise and vast knowledge of physical nature and his ignorance of real places on Earth. There are scientists, one must suppose, who know all about atoms or molecules or genes or galaxies or planets or stars, but who do not know where they are geographically, historically, or ecologically. Our schools are turning out millions of graduates who do not know, in this sense, where they are. In contrast, Barry's own father saw to it that he was educated for membership. My father was the first and the most passionate and comprehensive of my teachers, he writes. Too much occupied in town to teach me himself everything he wanted me to know, he saw that I found other teachers. He more or less turned me loose in a landscape populated by teachers. My grandfather and his hired hand, Nick, and many others. He set me free to know a place and a way of life and a kind of people outside the direction, perhaps beyond the scope and certainly beyond the respect of the mainstream of the society. Though I am sure he has had to tolerate rather than admire some of the results, it was a great gift. Free to know a place and a way of life and a kind of people. This is the freedom denied to Jaber's young preachers, denied to the trained specialists mass produced by the research university, and denied to nearly every other graduate of America's school system. Late in life, the twice widowed Hannah Coulter comes to understand the damage placeless educational institutions have done to her children. Both she and her second husband, Nathan, had wanted their children to go to college. They believed they owed it to them. But a painful lesson awaited these parents. It just never occurred to either one of us that we would lose them that way. The way of education leads away from home. That is what we learn from our children's education. This insight led Hannah immediately into a sweeping indictment of modern education, and she is a feisty woman. The big idea of education, from first to last, is the idea of a better place. Not a better place where you are because you want it to be better and have been to school and learned to make it better, but a better place someplace else. In order to move up, you've got to move on. I didn't see this at first, and for a while after I knew it, I pretended I didn't. I didn't want it to be true. But the college was not solely to blame. Hannah faces the possibility that she herself had planted the wrong longings and assumptions into her children's hearts and minds. Along the way, Nathan had tried to teach her about contentment. He had tried to teach her to live a life of gratitude. He had shown her that you mustn't wish for another life. You mustn't want to be somebody else. And that thought, Hannah says, passed through everything I know and changed it all. But another thought still nags at her. She fears that she and Nathan had told the stories of their own lives to their children in such a way as to make them discontent, <coughs> that the schools had only completed the destructive work that she had begun. She told the right stories because they were her stories. But did we tell the stories right, she wonders. It is possible to tell the right stories, but not to tell the stories right. That difference makes all the difference for the shape of a child's imagination. The question haunts her. But did we tell the stories in such a way as to suggest that we had needed a better chance or a better life or a better place than we had? The eventual return of Hannah's wayward grandson and the reordering of life that comes to him as farm work takes him into its rhythm and into its discipline gives Hannah reason for hope. When you have gone too far, as I think he did, she decides, the only mending is to come home. And that mending, when it comes, will be in no small part due to her love for him and for Port William. 
The defense of family and community and a way of life demands love. It also demands resistance to everything that opposes those things, including the modern university and its specialized education. Resistance takes effort. <laughs>